In this video we're going to have a brief introduction to collision detection, particularly as applied to 2D games. Collision detection is important, it's the type of thing that um, basically uh, most games will, will have and it's a very broad, very rich area and there's a lot of, of complexity we can add uh, to this in terms of being able to have potentially complex objects and to work out if they are in contact with one another and to do that quickly is actually quite a challenge. However, for this one here, we, we really just will be scratching the surface of it. We're going to look at, uh, if you like, really the introductory forms of um, collision detection, particularly uh, the ones that apply to two-dimensional games. And the good news is that thankfully this will, will, will work for the vast majority of the types of 2D games that we're doing. It's only really when you get into three-dimensional games where you have complex uh, objects um, that it, it gets more, more difficult. But we're going to keep it nice and simple in this one. Why do we have collision detection? Well, it's, it's important because I suppose within our game we simply have a bunch of objects and we want to give the appearance of having a um, of these objects being solid, of existing in a world where they occupy their own particular um, uh, space. So that means that as objects we can give them any arbitrary position we want to do. So it's up to us then as programmers to work out if we move an object, have we moved it in a way that it overlaps, it, it intersects, it collides with another object. And if it does, then we need to work out what action we're taking uh, in response to that. If it is moving it back away from it in terms of having a collision or, or, or otherwise interacting or being consumed through the, the collision. A um, whole host of things. So, so it comes into, as, as mentioned, you see the picture here, as, as given the notion of solidity. And if you don't have it, it obviously doesn't look too great. We'll use this as well if things are firing projectiles, again, to work out if projectiles hit an object, if the player's picking up a collectible, again to work out if the player has intersected with that collectible. So it's a key element to get interaction between the game objects uh, within our environment. Now central to, um, to most forms of collision detection is the idea of a bounding volume that uh, we could have, it could be a three-dimensional model, in our case it's more likely to be a 2D image that represents um, whatever object we have within the game. And we will bound that object, uh, and that bound is what we will use then um, when working out does it collide with something uh, itself. So we say here, game binds are often um, made using simple geometric shapes. So we could bound something within a circle, or within a square or within a box or something like that. More complex forms you can get into having sort of a simple 3D mesh. Um, there are actually, and, and again you'll, if you, you're delving into this here, you'll find some um, for 2D images, pixel perfect means it'll actually look inside the image to work out if you have non-transparent pixels that are colliding with one another, over, overlapping with one another. And for doing sort of uh, the worms or the lemming style of games, which notionally are played on an image, effectively they do their collision detection within that, that image. But here we're assuming we have an object uh, that is going to be represented as some type of 2D image that we're displaying on the screen. And in addition to that, we will define a simple geometric bound, and that bound is what we will use for doing our collision detection. So there's an example of some... Uh, bounds that we might have. Uh, so over here we're assuming that we, in terms of the figure, we have a person or an individual and we're using three different types of bound. One an axis aligned box, second one an oriented box, the third one a circle, to group together to, to etch out the defined area of that particular shape. Now, admittedly this shape is made of simple geometric shapes in the first place, but mostly our images would be a little bit more complex than this. Um, but you, you can see them there. So an axis aligned box is one that is, is aligned with the X and the Y axis. So the box always sort of has the same uh, X and Y uh, directions. Oriented box, it's the same idea. They're all boxes and you need to rotate them at any particular angle you want. And circles are, fair enough, circles. And what you can see from this is that 
For example, for the axis aligned box, um, if the rectangles, uh, for example, looking at the, the screen, the right hand leg, it, it is actually bound quite cleanly. The left hand leg was just stuck out a bit. Uh, again, the, the box again around that isn't such a tight fit. Um, you can see for the circle at the top, it's a reasonable fit. For the triangle, again, you're missing uh, sizable bits. For the oriented box, uh, there for anything that is basically rectangle in shape, it gives a nice map to it. And for the circles, well, it works well for the circle, obviously, um, but for some of the long, thin rectangles, you get a rather poor bound fitting around it. And that's going to be ultimately the trade-off that's associated with this, that some of the bounds will work well for certain types or certain orientation of shape and not well for other ones. So what's right here will depend in good extent on the actual types of object you have in your game and which one provides the best overall fit. Um, there are also three-dimensional variants of all of these. You can see them down there. So three-dimensional axis line box or oriented box or uh, a sphere. And, and again, you, you can extend this out. You can have ellipsoids. Uh, you can have lots of different uh, sort of simple mesh type shapes. So, um, and there's lots of other more uh, exotic things like k-dopes and so on. But we don't need to worry too much about those for two-dimensional games. So let's have a look at the use of a bounding circle first of all. Bounding circles are probably the most simple bound, um, but actually quite good uh, for a number of reasons. They're very fast and reasonably easy to work out if two of them overlap uh, from one another. They're also known as to be rotationally invariant in the sense if you, if you bound it within a sphere and the object rotates, it's still going to fit within that uh, sphere shape. So it's the simplest bound um, that we can use, but, but it works in quite a lot of cases. It's good for objects that are roughly circular um, in appearance. It's not good, for example, for a long, thin rectangle. That offers a poor bound there. And it's also good for objects that can rotate. So there we have a um, sort of spaceship on the screen. Um, it, okay, to, to a degree, it's, you can kind of imagine it as a circular bound. It's not a bad fit overall. If this was a top-down one, this was rotating and moving around. So there, again, a bound gives you a nice overall fit. So what we can say here, um, there's one bound. That's a full shape bound where we create a circle, uh, more or less put in the center here, that encapsulates all of the object. So you, you can see that but we've got a bit of extra space that we're not capturing. But if that object rotates, it's still going to rotate within the bound. So the bound will work irrespective of the rotation. You don't have to, even though the name suggests it bounds the, the object. Uh, we're doing this here because we want to have something for detecting, detision, uh, detecting collisions. So we could, if we wanted to, to use a smaller bound. And there's an example where we've gone a little bit off the center. We're using a smaller circle. So it, it captures more of the core of the, the ship. And if there's bits that are sticking out, well, there's bits that are sticking out. We sort of assume it doesn't really matter if they're, they're just the sticky out bits. Um, if they get hit, well, we're not going to worry about it. Um, but if the core in this case does get hit, then we take some corrective action uh, from that. So a range of options here available on, on how big you actually want the bound to be. For doing collision detection between two circles, it's very straightforward. We look at their two center points. We work out the distance from the center of one to the center of the other. And we then compare that distance to the sum of the two radii um, within it. So you can see here a, a couple of examples. Um, for the example on the left hand side, we've got no collision because the distance between the two centers is greater than the radius one plus radius two. And again, that makes perfect sense because if we add those two things together, that's how far um, you have to go to get the sides from both of them. If the separating distance is bigger, that means then the two things are not overlapping. Conversely, um, we have a collision or a touching collision if the distance is less than or equal to um, the sum of the two uh, radii values. So, so in that particular sense, if we look at the distance and then add the radius 1 radius 2 together, the distance will be less. That can only be the case if the two things then are overlapped. And if it's equal, that means they're touching. But that's normally also a trigger point for a collision. In terms of a, a piece of pseudocode, this is how it can look like. We can uh, assume we have a, a circle class which has a center point and a radius value. 
We work out the distance they are apart on the x-axis, so it's centre of the first um, uh, circle minus the centre of the second circle. The distance they're apart on the y-axis, so centre of the first one on the y minus the centre of the second on the y. Then we work out the square of the distance. So this is the, because we're basically, I mean, Pythagoras is the square root of the, the you know, the, the two things squared and added together. Pythagoras is what we're going to use to work this out, except we're not really. So the square of the distance is you just take the two x distances, multiply them and add that to the two y distances. And that takes into account you could have sort of a negative uh, distance from one to the other. So that gives us the distance squared. Now, if we were to use Pythagoras, we would then take the square root of that, and that would give us the actual distance apart, and we could compare that then to the sum of the two uh, radius values. We're not going to do that, because a square root is actually quite an expensive operation to do. So if I ask for the square root of a number, it actually has to perform a small algorithm in the background to, to work out what is a, a sufficiently accurate um, determination of that square root. And we want to avoid doing things which will take, uh, which could take relatively a long time. So what we do in this method is we calculate the sum of the, the radii, um, so C1 radius plus C2 radius, and we are then comparing the squared distance against the squared sum of the radius. So that effectively is a way of getting rid of the, the square root. As opposed to taking the square root and comparing that to the sum of the radii, we just square the sum of the radii and then compare that directly um, to the squared distance. Uh, it saves us doing that square root operation. Um, so a few lines of code, very quick to do, and will let us work out if two circles are overlapping. Axis aligned box then is the next one that we'll have uh, a look at to see how we might be able to use that. So it, the reason it's known as an axis aligned, so AABB, is that the, the bounds of it, the X and the Y side of the box, always has to be aligned with the X and the Y axis. The box can't rotate. Now what that means, if you have a look at the picture of the cat here, in all cases we have to find an axis aligned bounding box that bounds that cat and just bounds it as sort of tightly bound in each of the four cases. But as the cat rotates, and this shows the cat in different rotations, the shape and the size of the bound itself also has to change. And that's a limitation of the axis line bounding box. It's not great for things that can rotate because it will require you to recalculate the bound. Uh, in general, we don't want to spend our, our time doing that. So good for, for roughly for sort of rectangular shaped objects, and, and sort of a person's a decent rectangular shaped object uh, that doesn't rotate. So it's good for two, you know, side on 2D games. For an oriented bounding box, um, you can see the difference there for the cat. There we have, again, it's bound within a box, but the actual bound itself can rotate. So it, it's good for, you know, rectangular shaped things that can rotate. Um, only one aside in this here that you, it would be reasonable, and it still seems reasonable to my mind, that you would expect that, for, for, for example, for circle to circle, it's easy to do collision detection. For AABB to AABB, um, it's easy to do collision detection. You'd be assuming for an OBB to OBB, oriented bounding box to oriented bounding box, it's reasonably easy to do a collision. Turns out that's not necessarily the case and is actually quite a, um, a sizable step up in terms of complexity because the box can rotate. And that's particularly true of when you get into three dimensions. But even when you get in two dimensions, you have to use a bit of trigonometry to, by way of transforming the box based on its rotation. And um, it'll be beyond the scope of this particular lecture, but I'll, I'll show you some of the code in, in, in one of the actual lectures themselves. We'll have a, a brief overview um, and look at that. In terms of algorithms here, uh, it is easy and it's quick to work out if two AABBs intersect or don't intersect. Um, the particular one we're using here is if they do not intersect. So as a reminder, there's two ways of looking at this here. And this, this fundamentally is going to be the same as when we did the, the viewport test, where we're using rectangles. We want to work out if one rectangle um, for an object fell within the viewport. So no difference uh, to that. So if we're looking at the negative form of the test, working out if they do not intersect, and we can then view that as a positive form of the test, we're turning the, the negation off that. Two ABBs do not intersect uh, if any of the conditions you see at the bottom are true, that the, the bottom edge of A 
is above the top edge of B. So again, it makes sense. Or again, A's top edge uh, is below B's bottom edge, and so on. So we're not going to get into this more. In terms of the implementation of this, refer you back to the, the lecture we did on viewports, because it's exactly the same form of test. There, effectively, we were doing AABB versus AABB at that point. A couple of other aspects to, to bear in mind if we're thinking about slightly more sophisticated collision detection. So, so a few other aspects we can look at. Start off first of all with uh, grid-based approaches. So quite a lot of the 2D games will be based on, um, be played on a tile-based grid. You can actually use that more or less straight away to provide you with uh, an AABB, a bounding box for each of the different tiles. So they can have sort of be impassable or passable in terms of different types of, of platforms or objects. And your game objects then as they move around can compare themselves against the tile map and then use that as a way of, of determining how they, they stand, they interact with it to give, again, the appearance of solidity uh, within our map. In terms of bounds, we, we very much sort of looked at um, initially the idea that there's a single bound that encapsulates an object. That's an arbitrary decision. Um, so you can see a few examples here. If you look at the, the spaceship, where we go all the way from having one bound of of different types, um, there's sort of axis aligned or, or circles, um, to, to and, and, and oriented as well, to where you have multiple bounds across the object. And it makes it a little bit more complicated, particularly if the object can rotate, because then you have to rotate the location of the bound, uh, but it's not, generally speaking, that uh, difficult bit of trigonometry. And you can see from looking at them, you can end up with um, using multiple bounds if you have sort of simple ones, with fairly good um, overall approximation of the shape of it in terms of the bounds that we're using. And the picture over on the right hand side shows where we have sort of ground that is uh, you know, sort of not smooth, but there we're using a number of different bounds to give the appearance there of, of collision um, against that. If you're having carriers walking over, you want to be more careful because they, they will sort of get stuck in the edges. So it, again, it comes into to the reason why we're using collision detection if it is for, for an impact against it or versus a surface across which uh, an object or an entity can walk. So that's all we're going to do in this one. We, we really, really are only scratching the surface of what is available in terms of collision detection. Um, but nonetheless, what we've looked at here is probably all we need to know to get it going in most 2D games, um, certainly as, as, a, as a starter for 10. Key takeaways, um, by using simple geometric bounds, and, and spheres and ABBs are fairly simple ones, uh, it is possible without too much uh, effort or difficulty to work out when two of them overlap. And from doing that, then, we can use that detection to provide the appearance of solidity, to detect collisions between things, to detect pickups, or detect a whole other host of, of useful in-game events. <laughs>